I will be your host for this technical briefing. It's November 9th. It's Gender Day at COP, as well as a day focused on science and innovation. And today, immediately after our session, our technical briefing, we'll be joined by a fireside chat with Jude Krast with the wonderful Carol Saab. So looking forward to that. But tonight, I'm excited to introduce you to one of, I think, um, the most effective Canadian environmental activists that we've seen, Karen Mahan Carrington. She is an environmentalist, a trainer, a teacher. She was absolutely key in the landmark campaigns to protect the old growth rainforest at the Clackwood Sound and the Great Bear Rainforest on Canada's west coast. And since then, she's been really stopping the expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. She's been developing and implementing climate policy and organizing for climate justice, including in her former role as executive director of Greenpeace Canada. Now, Karen is the founder of Climate Hope, an organization that builds our resilience to tackle climate change. Welcome, Karen. It's wonderful to have you. Thanks, Shauna. Lovely to be here. So, Karen, you've been on the front lines uh, probably same time as I am, but more work, working on environment in specific. And I think of someone that has seen a lot in the global arena and 40 years since you started in this space, you were at COP for the Paris Agreement. You were there when it was signed on to. And I wanna get a sense from you on what your views are of this COP. Where do you see it in the long-term tra trajectory of environmental action? Well, I am really excited right now. Honest, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm so, I feel the beginning of relief. I feel like maybe it's not just that we're losing, you know, uh, less slowly. We might actually be starting to win. I feel like we're at a tipping point in this COP that I have never felt before. You know, in Paris, we were walking around telling people to talk, we should be talking about fossil fuels and people thought we were crazy. And there was just a very small subset of environmentalists who were talking about these issues. And now they're mainstream. And now, you know, Trudeau opened the conference by saying, yes, we have to cap and eventually phase out fossil fuels. It, that's, that's huge. And also the level of um, urgency that's happening. Ur like speed is obviously important for us now, right? We are approaching these ecological tipping points, but we're also approaching the social tipping points where some things like the ongoing development of fossil fuels will no longer be sanctioned. You know, which tipping point happens first is really critical. But, you know, Joe Biden opened the conference by calling climate change an existential threat to humanity. No world leader was saying that two years ago, even three years ago. So I feel like, yes, we have to keep them you know, we'll have to do all the work that we do to make sure they deliver on their commitments and to give them the social license to do so, but they get it in a way they've never had gotten it before. So I want to get a sense from you. You have uh, been a strong activist, I would say, very strong activist. And Often, I think in the early days of climate change activism, it was the doom and gloom. Look at what's coming. And it's real. I mean, we know that. We all feel it now. Every single one of us feel it, especially coming out of this summer in British Columbia and, and around the world. But you are also now shifting to a different kind of narrative around hope and resilience. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that. And where does that come from? It comes for me from a moral imperative, really, I feel like we are raising our children to listen to the world leaders say that we are in, in an existential moment where we may or may not survive. And to raise our children in a world without hope is like a kind of societal level of child neglect or abuse, really. There are the, the child psychologists call this a form of abuse now. Like, how is a child supposed to grow up in this world? And so for me, the work I want to do now is, yes, people, we have to realize how severe it is. And absolutely. And we can't, we can't engage in a kind of a hopium where we just sort of say, don't worry, you know, it will be okay. It's what's the, it's getting to where the hope emerges on the other side of grief and despair. That is, a, you know, the real place where we say, yes, we are on the precipice and we will make it through. 
how do we help our, especially our young people, but all of us hold that reality? It, you know, it's almost a paradox of we're, we're so close to the edge, but yes, we're gonna make it through. We've made it through many things before and we will make it through this. That's encouraging because I, I must admit, I've been feeling the heaviness and it's sometimes hard to find that hope and, and really finding those stores of hope amidst what we're going through right now. I want to I wanna shift because today is gender day. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can take a moment to reflect on the role of women in climate change and particularly the role of leadership that women have played in this fight. Well, it's really fascinating in, in the Canadian context, just watching and listening to and uh, Catherine McKenna. I mean, she has been an incredible role model. I was in the registration line um, here on the very first day when we arrived. And I said I was from Canada and people behind me were like, oh, Catherine McKenna. There were two women that worked internationally um, on biodiversity issues and they just said, we just love her. You know, I just think she is, um, has been an amazing voice, um, calling it like it is, just fantastic. And so she's a great example. Um, the, Mary Robinson um, got an award today um, from some Indigenous women from the Amazon. That was very beautiful to see. And on the other side, what I attended this morning as in, turn, in the context of the Gender Day was uh, an event to honor the missing and murdered Indigenous women. And there were Indigenous women there from the Amazon, of course, from Canada, of course, from, uh, from the United States, from different tribes and different nations. And it really feels like women are on both ends of this, that there is an opportunity for female leadership and you see it happening in a way that is rarely has rarely happened before. And women are on the front lines, you know, listening to these women speak about the man camps that the fossil fuel industry brings in, you know, a work camp to set up uh, to house their workers. But of course those become places where there's lots of alcohol and lots of drugs and First Nations women have um, been abused through those camps. It's really, really tragic. You know, the, the, and the beautiful matriarchs today, you know, they, they really make it clear. They just said like, we, we're not the women of the earth. We are the earth. We are one in the same. And the damage that's being done to the earth is being done to them. And just listening to them, uh, it never fails to move me and it never fails to surprise me how gracious they are with us. With us who come from so-called settler society, I don't know that I would be nearly as kind um, as they are and as generous as they are if I was in their shoes. Yeah. You have been um, a woman in this space for a long time as well. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on this theme for just a little bit um, and look at where you have found the, the capacity to, to work in this space and continue to show up year after year after year amidst so much. So, so as a woman, what does it mean to step in the space for you? Well, it's quite tied up with motherhood really, isn't it? I mean, it's hard not to be, not to, you know, I remember when my son, who's now Aiden, who is now 27 was born and I looked at him on day one and thought, you know, I am going to do this for you. You know, I am going to make the world a better place for you. And then, and then I realized, oh, that's what, that's sort of the, you know, that's the metaphor that we all sort of speak about. How do we make the world a better place for our children? But you really feel it in your body. You feel, I am going to protect you with every cell of my body. And I think why I'm doing the work I'm doing now is we haven't been able to protect them. We have not been able to protect them. Our generation has not, we have failed the younger generation. We've not been able to protect them. And so for me, it's, you know, I almost think it comes from my mothering instinct that I can't make the world better, but maybe I can make it easier for you to be in this broken world and help, help you figure out how to navigate a life that is so, uh, so full of uncertainty, so, so much tragedy that, that our kids are witnessing. And so I think that it's, I think that, keep, that keeps me going. I want to I want to switch gears a little bit here and um, 
I know that in addition to working on forest and on the front line and the, on the Great Bear Rainforest, you also were involved in the groups that, that got the Greenest City Action Plan going. You were one of many that were involved in that. And I want to I want to turn because one of the things that we're doing here is really looking at cities. And so when you look at the whole um, challenges that are facing cities, what do you think those greatest challenges are in relationship to climate? And in turn, what do you think uh, some of the actions are that we can be taking at this local level? Interesting. Um, well, you all are uh, climate policy, city climate policy people more than, more than I. Uh, so I don't know if I wanna venture into the specific policies, but this is what I would like to say to people working at municipal level. The number one message at this COP is urgency. I was at a small activist party uh, launching the fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty and Bill McKibben spoke. Um, and he's always so succinct and, you know. Just Remind like, everybody who Bill McKibben is. Just so Bill those McKibben is um, an American author. He started and he started 350.org and he has written 20 books on climate change. It, he says he wrote the first book on, on climate change, first popular book. Um, and he's just a great, uh, He's, he's great at pinning the moment and being able to express the moment. And what he said to us was, the only thing that matters now is, is speed. You know, he said the most important F word of the day is fast, mm -hmm. because we are in a race between the ecological tipping points and the social tipping points. And so why I think municipalities and cities are the most important frontier right now is because you all can move at a speed that nationals and larger subnationals cannot. You know, even, you know, we listened to Obama yesterday who said, you know, my government's gonna move slow. Like I understand, and this is the problem because this pro we can't move slow to address this problem. But I will tell you that even Biden, who, you know, of course he was championing, uh, is not gonna be able to move nearly as fast as we need. So the only people that can move as quickly as we need our cities and municipal governments. So I think that you all are, we're betting on you. Ah. So my last question, because I've got one more minute or two, is it's November 12th and you're back in Canada. Maybe you won't be back in Canada yet because I know you have family on this side, uh, but maybe when you do get back into Canada, what's the headline you want to read about this cop? want to read that we got pledges that came to below 1.8. I think there's still potential for some um, LDCs, lesser developed countries, and some of the vulnerable countries. Are, there's conversations about them possibly coming in with some new pledges. And I think if we actually could get pledges that brought us to 1. Oh, as close to 1.5 as possible, but 1.6, that's huge. That is huge. In, we went into Paris with two degrees as the goal. And we came out with, we'll kind of strive for 1.5, but it was very, you know, it's pushed way out. And if we came out of here that much closer to 1.5, then I think that that might mean that we are over the, over the tipping point and we're on our way to, to really doing the hard work that needs to be done. And it was really the voices of small island states that got us to 1.5 with the support of so many others, but it, it was the small island states that has pushed the world. And I think it's such a, a testament to who shows up, who creates policy. You've got to show up to actually get the change you want to see. And so I am so glad to see you here and so glad to see that you're also part of a community of people that are covering this, the various different side events in all their complexities. It really is, uh, for those that aren't here, it's, it's incredible. You cannot keep up with all the things that are going on Amazing. Each day. It is incredible. Thank you so much, Karen. And uh, I wish you well in these final days. And I hope we do see the 1.8 1, 1. or perhaps even 1.5 in those headlines. Um, thanks so much. And uh, we'll see you back in Vancouver. Okay, keep up the great work. Care. I'm now going to, in just a minute, Jude Krast is going to join. We're going to just take one minute and he's going to join us for our fireside chat. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you again tomorrow.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our audience members from coast to coast. My name is Drew Krasta, and I'm your host for our series of fireside chats throughout COP26 here in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, we're coming to you live uh, at 6.46 p.m. GMT, that is 10.46 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, at the end uh, of the uh, second day of the second week of COP26. Now, I can see all of your faces, but I'm just imagining you all just bright-eyed and, and just grinning from ear to ear in excitement of uh, for uh, the chat today with uh, today's guest, we'd like to thank you for taking the time to be with us wherever you are. And we are very excited to be joined today by the CEO of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, Carol Saab. Um, Carol is a tireless champion for cities and communities, driving an ambitious vision for local government leadership in building a more sustainable, prosperous, and inclusive Canada. Um, and I, I don't, for a lot of our practitioners here, I don't really have to sing Carol's praises, but at this point, it's more so that I kind of want to. Uh, recognized by peers as tenacious, ambitious, and a game changer, and consistently voted as one of the top 100 lobbies in Canada, uh, she is a 2020 recipient of Canada's Top 40 Under 40 and the Women of Influence in Local Government Award from Municipal World. Carol's leadership and effective team building have positioned FCM as one of the most respected and effective advocacy organizations in Canada. And I've had the pleasure of briefly meeting uh, Carol in uh, Glasgow here, and I'm so excited to uh, get to speak uh, uh, further with her. We're thrilled to have a strong voice for Canada City speaking with us here today. Good evening, Carol. Thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much, Jude. It's so great to... to... Oh, sorry. can you hear me? There we go. I can hear okay. you. Okay. You're good. Me. I'm coming in now. Okay. <laughs> well, I was just saying thank you. That's what that's what you couldn't hear. A big thank you to you, Jude. It's so nice to to be here with you. And thanks for all the work uh, you've been doing to really uh, help amplify and support and, and press the city voice uh, here at, at COP26. Absolutely. City voice. So let's start then with an obvious first question. As one of the main national advocacy voices for Canada's cities at COP26, along with uh, Mayor Mike Savage, who's here from uh, Halifax and chair of the Big City Mayor's Caucus, what have been some of your major learnings from local governments across the world at COP? Yeah, thanks very much, Jude. Well, we've had a, a good week uh, and a busy week here, uh, you know, uh, filled with learnings um, from counterparts across Across the world, um, also with uh, you know opportunities that we've been indoors, we've been able to open with our own government, uh, with partners in the Canadian context as well, um, or where we've been together with other partners from around the world and, and learning together. And I think um, you know to the point of the earlier panel just now, um, really the message we're taking away and that we we are uh, a big part of helping drive uh, is around urgency and the necessity of of working together, being aligned. Uh, and really moving quickly to, to build, to implement local pathways to net zero. Um, and similarly around adaptation uh, and the necessity of, of serious and quick engagement of this um, going forward. And so uh, we've, been, we've been really um, quite, uh, quite active trying to trying to push those themes through uh, conversation carrying uh, carrying a very clear but simple um, and very necessary message about the necessity of engaging local government pretty directly um, in this work uh, utilizing them leveraging uh, cities and communities as, as clear implementation partners and I think what we're taking back with us you know there are many many very tangible um, ideas that we've learned from, from colleagues but I'll tell you a, a big thematic for me um, here and it's something that's easy to be struck by when you're at something that's the scale of COP is really around the necessity of alignment. You know, our, as we've seen a lot when we're hearing a lot of pledges, there are number of commitments being made. Those are important. It's significant. Um, but we're also seeing a real necessity uh, for uh, for partnership, for getting uh, getting together, making sure that we're maximizing um, every public dollar and every private dollar that's going to come the way of this work. Um, and similarly, that we're doing it as quickly as we can, and that's going to take real coordination. And so that's both uh, across governments in the Canadian context, so, you know, from a, a federal to provincial to, to local government level, um, but also with our 
their partners. You know, we've had many conversations where folks are working on things, buildings, uh, retrofits being a great example, um, where, where the number one uh, obstacle is going to be ensuring that we're going to get the alignment right to move fast enough. And so um, that's been, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, certainly um, was a leading assumption in a lot of our work coming forward, but something that has been really evident um, about the work and the task at hand right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned a number of things, urgency and the need for alignment. Let's let's start with urgency first. We know, uh, being from British Columbia, uh, the climate emergency is real and present as it is for a lot of communities across uh, Canada. The yeah. effects also have required a lot of local governments to adapt. Uh, sometimes quite literally overnight. Um, so what can Canadian local governments then, uh, large and small, look forward to receiving from the COP26 process in that support for adaptation? Yeah, thanks. Adaptation has been a really big priority for us in these conversations at COP. Uh, and, you know, we know from our members that that local governments are ready to partner. We're ready to scale up the investments coming in, in mitigation, but also in adaptation um, to protect our communities at home. You know, you've, you've given a great reference here. We know that Canada's climate is warming. We know that the effects are projected to intensify. Um, and we're seeing firsthand in our communities across the country, the impact uh, and the intensified frequency of many weather events, you know, sea level rise, coastal erosion, permafrost melt, uh, the intensity of forest fires. I mean, you referenced the really um, gutting, uh, gutting event in, in the town of Lytton where, you know, destroyed by wildfires before the fire trucks could leave the station. I mean, truly, truly um, scary things happening and devastating things and so what you know local governments are already uh, working uh, to make the most of the limited tools driving local adaptation projects we're seeing this in communities across the country they're upgrading the size of stormwater pipes to handle more rainfall you know we're using fuel mitigation initiatives um, to protect communities from wildfire investing in natural infrastructure like wetlands um, so communities can absorb more rainfall uh, and in some cases even avoid the need for bigger pipes and so all, all of these things are happening but still many challenges remain to your point um, municipalities uh, we know that they are need support to assess the local climate impacts, their vulnerabilities, um, to understand their adaptation options, and and to be able to then plan and implement adaptation projects. Um, and that's, you know, in the form of capacity building and really targeted support um, toward integrating climate considerations into their asset management planning and decision making processes. And so, you know, Canada is making some some significant commitments in this space. We know the government's committed to a national adaptation strategy. We've been trying to have some of those conversations here in the ground on, on the ground in Glasgow to understand um, where this is headed. It can be important in guiding future federal actions in this space, but um, really has to be pretty meaningfully informed formed and co-designed with local government if it's going to be implemented in an effective way on the ground. Um, we know that the government has has invested as well in, in the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund, and that's got a particular emphasis in supporting smaller municipalities. Um, that's a direct response to our advocacy. They've got a natural infrastructure fund, and so it's promising to see some of these um, developments come forward. Um, and, and, you know, the reality, though, is that more is needed, and that's part of the conversation we've been having here on the ground. We've been um, really highlighting uh, work that we've done uh, at FCM with uh, the Insurance Bureau as partners, um, where we determined that at least you know $5.3 billion annually uh, is needed to adapt local infrastructure to the impacts of climate change. That's a big gap uh, that we're going to have to come together across governments and across sectors to figure out how are we going to do this. Um, the thing about that number, though, is that we also know that that investing in adaptation is that it brings a strong return on investment, right? And we know that the rough range for every dollar spent, uh, six are avoided, six dollars are avoided in damages. Um, so it makes sense to invest uh, in adaptation um, and to, to really prioritize natural climate solutions in that capacity. Municipalities are ready to do more. Um, and so we've been pressing that case here on the ground in Glasgow. The government seems to um, be interested in having this conversation and, and working. And so um, hopefully we're going to see 
be this the sort of accelerant to the conversations um, given given the urgency that's been expressed here at COP uh, play out in the coming uh, in the coming uh, months as the government gets ready to make its fall economic statement as they get ready for the federal budget um, we're going to need to see some some progress pretty significantly and and some um, you know a real willingness to sit down uh, and figure out how to get this right across governments right so that that answers part of my the other question I was going to ask around that federal alignment roadmap looking forward. But um, so then let me uh, let me ask this. So uh, earlier today, um, I was at the Bloomberg Green Summit uh, where Secretary uh, John Kerry, uh, the United States Special Envoy for Climate Change, was speaking. Uh, one of the things that he had outlined was that nearly two to three it, trillion per year is needed globally to probably uh, to address climate mitigation and adaptation. It was coming up in the context of the 100 billion number. Um, obviously, both those numbers, the trillion and the billion, it's pretty hard to comprehend. Canada's GDP is 1.6 trillion. Bringing it to local communities in real terms, you've identified a couple of funds over here. What would you um, highlight as other mechanisms, uh, whether it's regulatory support or funding support um, or, or things like that, that local governments uh, should be seeing uh, in, when, they, when they have these partnerships on adaptation and mitigation? Yeah, it's an it's an excellent question, and I mean, I think uh, again, I stress the point here on alignment, and I'm I'm keeping an eye a little bit on the chat here that's coming up, and folks are sort of talking about the necessity of beyond funding. You know, how are we going to come together and comprehensively create strategy in this space, which is which it has to be uh, has to be moving um, forward as well, so that we can answer the the how as effectively and quickly as possible, as well as the um, the funding gap. Uh, the other thing I would say is that. Um, we really need to see some very intentional um, focus on local capacity development uh, to, to really assess and respond to those climate risks. I'm thinking in particular about regional climate modeling, um, conducting vulnerability and risk assessments, integrating equity considerations and indigenous knowledge into an adaptation planning. You know, that's been a really um, positive and strong presence here at COP and, and certainly, um, certainly a takeaway for us coming back home. Um, um, and then, you know, as I was saying earlier, integrating climate into how we do asset management in the longer term. And so, I, you know, I think we can't underestimate uh, the necessity of, of not only um, bringing the, the, the funding to the table, but ensuring then that we're going to be able to implement that uh, at, the, at the scale and pace that's, that's required. Um, and, you know, I'll say, I'll say this, that we, you know, again, the alignment thing, it's, it's an easy thing to say, oh, we need to work together, but um, there that means, uh, you know, really boldly and ambitiously moving past what have been pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, significant obstacles from a jurisdiction perspective, right? It means getting around a table as orders of government and having conversations. It means um, ensuring that the right sector voices are in those conversations as well. And that's, um, you know, we've been slowly working our way towards that, I would say, but if we're going to move as quickly as we need to, uh, then the voice of, of cities and communities and local governments needs to um, be welcome uh, more meaningfully uh, at, uh, at ground level in these conversations and around the tables uh, where decisions are being made. Right. Um, so then um, let's look at some of the house. So um, it, I'm a part of the Cities and COP26 initiative. And one of the things that we've enjoyed at the set as a part of this initiative over the last couple of months is working so closely with your team at the FCM uh, and bringing a lot of cities and local climate practitioners and civil society together to surface some of these key messages and ask to the government, um, some of which we've we've seen percolate throughout COP26. But I'm wondering in, in how you've interacted with, with the con you know, we uh, we were uh, working with a, a group called the Under Two uh, Coalition, uh, which brought together uh, you know actors from uh, from around the world, uh, including uh, many state level actors in the U.S. alongside cities. Um, there was a Canadian presence there as well, um, and we were talking about specifically this point around so and you know and they were coming together with with firm commitments in this space. You know, sixty eight you know um, commitments, and what was interesting at, at 
that that event was a theme that you sort of um, spoke to earlier, and it was actually echoed by um, Governor Inslee of Washington, who's, go, who's doing some amazing work in this space, um, where he said, you know, we keep having these conversations at these conferences, at referencing the, the work and the necessity of engagement of subnational governments. Um, and he was really pushing for, for us to recharacterize that as uh, instead of subnational, as supranational um, in the context of this being where we have the most ability um, to, to, to implement, to move faster with more flexibility um, than other orders of government. And so to that end, um, I think we're really going to um, need to see, and in, in the context of some of the funds being announced, um, mechanisms that support as direct as possible um, to cities and local governments going forward. We've got excellent models um, to build on. I have to say that's a key takeaway for me. We, I think we have some real Canadian success stories um, to build on, um, everything from sort of the permanent transit fund to the green municipal fund we've got real real starting points for for how to do this quickly how to scale quickly um, as directly with the kind of predictability and stability that's necessary for local governments um, in the long term and so um, those are those are um, conversations that we've been able to have here we've been busy all week with our government um, which is excellent we you know and that's uh, you know I have to say the kind of uh, city's presence that's increasing is um, in our context, you know, we felt like we had very significant access to, to the ministers, the Minister of Environment, the Minister of Natural Resources, um, direct conversations with the Canadian ambassador uh, for climate change. Um, similar, similarly with um, some of the bodies that are working in this space around net zero, the advisory board, climate choices. I mean, it's been a, it's been a week full of conversation around how to do this. And then at main um, takeaway I think for everyone engaged in the conversation is the necessity um, of, of cities and local government in, in delivering and, and being enabled um, to deliver at scale and so um, I'll be looking for the word uh, cities and local government to appear in mandate letters uh, very clearly um, and not just very specifically in the portfolios of environment or natural resources, um, but in the context of applying a climate lens to things like housing uh, in the context of the work that we need to do really across the board. And um, and then from there, correspondingly, as, as these kinds of commitments got, start getting turned into programs, um, we're going to we're looking for mechanisms that are informed, co-developed um, by local government and as direct as possible. Um, because again, back to the theme of urgency, uh, we need to move very quickly uh, and together. All right, so then let's let's look at then engaging folks on the ground at the front lines that cities often do. I'll admit, um, um, since uh, we first uh, ran into each other physically here in Glasgow, I was just completely amazed uh, for our folks at home who don't like who don't know the context. Carol literally jumped off a plane at Glasgow and <laughs> got, got to the blue zone that is just owners with security and just showed up at a panel and and the the crowd was blown away. But just at, at the at the at the at the perspective coming through. And so the reason I'm bringing this up, you've seen the physical structure, Carol, off the blue zone. You've seen the visuals that have come out around the separation, the commentary, the the, uh, the that how folks who aren't able to be present don't necessarily have the context over what's um, uh, what's going on. So going back across the ocean to Canada, like how do you see cities uh, after COP26 working with citizens, working with residents? Uh, to engage on climate action in a meaningful and relevant uh, relevant way. Yeah, I think, well, I think, um, you know, you're naming the task at hand for all of us is, is really how are we going to, how are we going to do uh, more together, how we're going to do, you know, the sort of faster, further together kind of concept is, is something that's really been, been pushed here as we go forward. And so, um, you know, I'll say this, and it's funny at that panel that you're referencing, um, David Miller from C40 um, made a point that, you know, 
he's not paying that, you know, not too inspired, not paying too much attention to the sort of broad negotiations and conversations that are happening because he's focused on the what what can we do right now, what needs to happen right now. And I think that's the right um, the right sense of urgency to have around the issue. And in the Canadian context, um, we have immediate opportunities, you know, commitments that have already been made uh, that we need to see everything from the permanent transit fund to the electrification of transit vehicles. Um, we've got a new housing accelerator fund that that really stand to be significant um, move significant markers for us in the king so we've got you know I think not losing sight of the tangible let's get to the implementation how do we start working on these program commitments and then we have some near-term opportunities you know from the what's already been committed to what we need to see and I think that it's going to you know cities at home are going to need to continue to keep the pressure on um, to continue to have those conversations uh, we know that we have work to do collectively as governments around buildings and retrofits and codes together that we need to move on we know that we've got, um, you know, electrification beyond transit of municipal fleets is something that we were starting to um, see a lot of action on. We want to drive uh, sort of attention and investment in that area. Um, similarly, on other opportunities around the management of landfills. I mean, there are very immediate, tangible things. And so uh, the conversations we've been having, and it was the similar in that first conversation we had right when I got off a plane, um, is the same, is that, you know, we, we want to keep grounding this in the work that needs to happen now, the work that's possible right now, um, and the work that many cities are already doing and that we need uh, further uh, enabling conditions from other governments to help deliver on. And I think that's that's what everybody can do is to continue the focus on the urgency and to continue to work together. And so the work that um, cities did through FCM, through some of these other bodies that I've already referenced um, to come together and carry a pretty consistent message here at COP is the kind of um, coalition that we need to see continue uh, to push this message on the ground and um, where you know we've got some of these big milestones coming up um, and given the urgency of the crisis I mean we we've got a very near-term uh, challenge and opportunity um, to seize on to make sure that we're gonna we're gonna insist on the kind of action that has been um, so heavily focused on and talked about this week Right. And um, so then let's uh, quickly talk about civil society uh, coming out of this. I, we uh, at Cities and COP26, we've uh, been we're so grateful to have the partnership of so many amazing civil society uh, organizations uh, like the Canadian Urban Institute, C40, uh, Carbon Disclosure Project, CDP, uh, and many others. One uh, in the chat, Alison Ashcroft of Canadian Urban Sustainability Practitioners has done amazing modeling, pointing out uh, uh, emissions sources and other data relevant to this. Looking from, from your perspective, seeing what's now transpired at COP, seeing how things are temporarily shifting and becoming more relevant, what do you think are the strategic intervention points for civil society to support city, uh, to support uh, uh, higher orders of government uh, in, in working with cities or even with the FCM uh, moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question, you know, and I, I've been reflecting a lot on this um, in the context and part of the work that that um, the center has been leading and through the run up to, to COP in these conversations and, and through the conversations we've been having through the week, you know, um, many civil societies have had a very enabling and helpful presence to pre um, on the ground here in Glasgow to help advance uh, the city's agenda and the local government agenda. Um, and I think, again, to the point of, of alignment, I think that applies as well to this sort of coalition of advocates where um, we need to continue to have this uh, level of sustained dialogue, uh, to have an openness to partnership. That's certainly the direction um, we want to continue to build on and enhance significantly at FCM. Um, I mean, I, you know, I've said this in a number of different contexts, and it, it applies um, here in this in this question as well, um, is that we really do need all hands on deck. And most importantly, they need to be working together if we're going to move this forward. And I think there is a very active role for civil society in the conversation. And the key is um, creating the appropriate uh, venues to keep this conversation going. You know, it's, it's good for us to accelerate those connection points at a week like COP. Um, a couple weeks like COP, it's good for us to, to start, um, you know, really driving those conversations uh, cohesively. Um, but we need to do that in between COPs if we're going to move as quickly as we can. 
in. So um, I just, you know, I'm so encouraged by by the kind of coalition I see developing. Um, and I just, you know, want to, on, on behalf of FCM, I would thank sort of our civil society partners um, for the amplification, for the support, for the expertise that we've been able to lean on um, in the context of COP now and in the run up. Um, and also offer, offer our sort of sense of partnership right back. And I think that um, what we need to see um, and where civil society can be most helpful um, is continuing to create uh, awareness that helps put pressure um, on the need for uh, a city's agenda, that helps put pressure on the need for the engagement of local government. And I think that's um, a lot of groups are very effectively doing, but the, the more that that can be amplified, the more room that can be elbowed out, um, the easier that makes uh, the, the jobs of folks in local government to, to try to advance those conversations. So, um, you know, partnership, partnership, partnership. And, and I have to say in the Canadian context, it's uh, it's been really um, motivating to see how far we've come in, in that kind of a coalition. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're just about at time at the risk of repeating yourself because you have a lot of takeaways over here. Um, for all of our viewers back home, uh, and you're hearing from D. Carol Saab, CEO of FCM. Um, what are the top three messages you want to resonate in people's, in people's minds as they, as they move forward now? Okay, that is a good question, you know, and maybe I'll just premise it by saying, um, you know, I, I've been thinking a lot about sort of our motivation and, and was listening to, to Shauna talk earlier as well. And, you know, 2050, my eldest child is going to be exactly my age right now. And that, you know, as I was getting set to come here and, and drive these conversations I think everybody is is focused uh, in some ways and I'll get to what message two needs to be to make that real but the, the top message um, certainly I would echo is one of urgency that we need to move uh, now and we need to move faster um, so to do more faster and uh, the second message uh, I think is that we need to do that uh, as as in as an aligned way as possible um, if we're actually going to do it fast enough because we have a real there's a real risk um, of, of uh, sort of coordination um, being and and sort of jurisdictional barriers and and that kind of thing being being a key obstacle to how fast we need to move um, so we need to do more faster we need to do it uh, together um, and then we actually need to do it you know as the, as the last piece you we're hearing a lot um, about the necessity from from yes okay pledges but it's time to get to implementation and i think from the local government perspective um that's the message we've been trying to drive we are the key uh implementation partner uh and we've already got some amazing uh tools that we can leverage and build on and so um you know implementing uh, implementation, I would say, would be, and a focus on that would be the third message I'd underscore. Carol, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. We know you have an incredibly busy schedule while you're here in town. And thanks for talking, with all, just spreading that message for all the viewers back home and giving them a little bit of insight on what's in store for Canadian cities. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Jude. And again, a thank you to you and to Shauna and the Centre for the incredible work you've been doing on the ground here. Thanks. Well, folks, that brings us to the close of today's daily briefing. We will be back same time tomorrow. That's 6.30 p.m. GMT, 10.30 a.m. Pacific time, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. You can fill in uh, the rest of the time zones. We appreciate you taking the time to tune in during the second week of COP26. And so all I've left to say is good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and goodbye.